afternoon, everyone from the Middle East Institute in Singapore. Uh, welcome to the second lecture uh, of our flagship event, the Middle East uh, Public Lecture Series. Uh, my name uh, is Aisha Al Sarihi, and I am a research fellow at the Middle East Institute, uh, and I am very delighted to be uh, moderating this session today. Um, I would like to thank everyone who is joining us today, either in the room physically or online uh, via Zoom. Um, so today's topic uh, uh, of the lecture is, you know, last week we had uh, a lecture in the geopolitical, uh, com like on the competition within cooperation. Basically, it focused uh, on, on the GCC. Today, uh, in today's lecture, we would like to go beyond the GCC and focus on the broader Middle East. Um, and specifically, we are going to highlight on Iran uh, and Turkey and their role uh, in influencing the uh, geopolitical competition dynamics uh, in the Middle East. And for that, uh, I do, um, today I'm joined uh, with uh, two distinguished speakers. Uh, on my right, Dr. Asif uh, Shaju, and uh, on my left, uh, uh, Professor Gorgi Bustin. So um, let me give uh, a little bit of uh, background for each uh, speaker. Dr. Asif uh, Shuja is a senior research fellow uh, here at the Middle East Institute. He is an Iran expert, and his research is focused uh, on Iran domestic politics, uh, Iranian nuclear issues, uh, the foreign policy, and Iran uh, regional rule. He was previously associated with the International Center for Strategic Studies in Abu Dhabi as an unresident fellow. Uh, his other research uh, affiliations uh, include um, the Iranian Council of World Affairs and the Center for Air Power Studies uh, in New Delhi. Dr. Asif obtained his PhD from uh, GNYU in New Delhi, and he is the author of a book titled uh, India-Iran Relations Under the Shadow of Iranian Nuclear Issues. Uh, and then my uh, uh, and uh, Asif will focus on Iran today in the lecture. Uh, all, also, I would like to introduce Professor Gorgi uh, Bustin. Uh, Dr. Gorgi is a visiting research uh, uh, professor at the Middle East Institute. Uh, he has a career in diplomat and academia. Uh, where he served uh, as a Hungary ambassador to Indonesia uh, and uh, Iran. In 2011, Dr. Bustin was appointed a deputy envoy of the United Nations in Iraq, responsible for the uh, political, analytical, electoral, uh, and constitutional support uh, components of the UN mission in Iraq. Uh, Dr. Bostian holds a degree uh, in Arabic history from Damascus University in Syria and a doctorate in Arabic language and uh, Semitic uh, philology uh, from Lorand Etuv uh, University in Hungary. I hope I spell it right. <laughs> he, uh, along with uh, his native Hungarian, he speaks English, French, Arabic, Farsi, Malay, uh, and Russia. Welcome uh, to both uh, of our speakers. Um, and before we jump in into the lecture, I just want to give a, a bit of a note on the structure of the event. So uh, in today's lecture, we the speakers will give um, their remarks within 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and then after that, we will open the floor for the questions. Um, so people in the room, you will get the mic to pose your question and those online, please. Uh, you, and you are welcome to put your questions in the chat box uh, so we can take them later. 
Without further, further ado, now I uh, will start with Dr. Asif uh, to give his remark. Uh, thank you so much, Aisha, for that kind introduction. And uh, <clears throat> if you could have our my slides, uh, please. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, if you could see uh, uh, the today's lecture, there there are some you know very important uh, terminologies uh, which actually appear on the title. And the first of all is geopolitical competition. So this term geopolitical, especially in Iranian context, is very important to decipher to understand because there are differences of understanding of this term and a lot of issues actually uh, prop up because of this uh, terminologies and its conception uh, amongst the players if that of the region. Then of course, there are two players we are focusing primarily in this particular lecture with my colleague, uh, Ambassador uh, Georgi. Uh, so I'll be focusing on Iran and he'll be focusing on uh, Turkey. So we, the dimension that we have uh, chosen to take in this uh, talk is, uh, uh, we have been looking at the regional system of Middle East and we shall be exploring whether these two powers have been the spoiler of the system or not. So first of all, a uh, geopolitical, you know, uh, in terms of discipline, uh, is a kindly, you know, uh, controversial term. Different people uh, uh, define it differently. Uh, so I'll just make it very simple for our own understanding. Uh, let us just treat it as a, a synonym of uh, international politics. Okay, uh, because uh, in reality, it started with uh, that form of politics among states where the geography is involved and involved a lot. So in geography, we will have uh, the territory and the population, but there is a particular dimension of seas also that actually creates a lot of problem for the faraway players to uh, play a certain role in a particular region. So that's why geopolitics is very important for our understanding. Then we have a regional system. So we also have got to understand what exactly is the regional system, which supposedly Iran and Turkey, whether they are or whether they are not, spoiling. So before beginning uh, those two dimensions, let us try and understand why we have clubbed these two powers together, uh, that is Iran and uh, Turkey. So these are some of the reasons why we tend to uh, understand the region's particular dimension of geopolitical competition by focusing on these two powers together. If you could have a look at it, uh, these two are non-Arab Muslim Middle Eastern countries. There is one more non-Arab country that is Israel, right? So these three have very unique uh, standing in this particular region. And uh, being in minority, as there is a psychology of that place, when they are, you are in minority, you have to have a lot of power to survive in a competitive world. So my understanding is that because of this particular identity of being non-Arab, Middle Eastern countries, these three powers are really very important. So here in this particular lecture, we will primarily focusing on non-Arab Muslim Middle Eastern countries. So these are basically Iran and Turkey. Now the second particular important point related to them clubbing together is that both of them have been having old ancient empires. That means they have had a very long history of being powerful players on the globe. You can see uh, Persian Empire for 220 years. That was a long reign. And Ottoman Empire, which relates to Turkey, that was also for about 600 years. So that kind of a background, that kind of a history, actually gives a certain type of strategic thinking in continuum for hundreds and hundreds of years. And that actually is imbibed by the leaders of these countries also. Now, if the leaders keep changing, then the strategic culture and the dynamics of it may also change slightly. What is so important about these two countries is that the leaders of these two countries are also have been quite constant for decades. In case of uh, Iran, you can see Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, who has been the supreme leader. That means the ultimate power wielder of that country. He has been ruling since 1989. That's more than 30 years, right? Similarly, Turkey is also ruled by a powerful figure, Mr. Recep Tayyip Erdogan, since 2003, sometimes as a president, sometimes as a prime minister. 
But whenever these kind of constitutional positions were created, when he was the president, president had the highest power. When he was the prime minister, prime minister had the highest power. So these are the rulers at the apex of the political system of these two countries. Now let us see what is this regional system that we are focusing in the Middle East. How do we define this system of this particular region? As I look at it, there could be four, four main features which could be identified through which we can, we can visualize, visualize, make it tangible, uh, the system that is there in the Middle East. So these four components are, first of course, is a very understandable that these are predominantly Arab states. As I said, that there are you know many states all of them are Arab except perhaps these three states. So this kind of uh, positioning gives a particular mindset to the other powers, which we are, you know, uh, which we have in this particular region, other than Turkey, Iran, and of course, Israel. These other powers are all Arab states. So this kind of, uh, you know, connecting thread is running all over the place. Then we have, the preeminence of the US power. You see uh, in the Gulf, uh, US power bases in, the, in Qatar, uh, their inroads in, in Iraq after, after the uh, invasion. Uh, everywhere you can see US footprint. So much so that we are now talking about whether it is there, whether it is receding. That means it's been an accepted fact that it has been there for long. It has been a preeminent uh, power in the region. U.S. footprint is there. That's a very important particular feature of this particular regional system. Then what are what is the role of that particular power that is U.S. and uh, how is it perceived by these Arab states? Uh, these two dimensions have created a situation where the region, and particularly the region surrounding the Persian Gulf, it has been securitized. So when you securitize a region, you identify a threat, and then you see that, okay, there is a particular threat from which we need to secure the region. So incidentally, here in this particular region, that threat has been mostly perceived uh, Iran as a threat. So that creates most of the dynamics that we see in this region. Now, the fourth feature, it also has a very historical value and that is the receding relevance of Palestine. The state of Palestine and uh, the, 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 the wishes to create a state of Palestine and the establishment of the state of Israel, uh, these two uh, created a, a scenario where a lot of politics was generated in terms of the support of these Arab countries to the cause of the Palestinians. So we have all heard about the Abraham Accord and the relationship of different players of this region uh, with Israel. So <clears throat> that gives an impression that the relevance of Palestinian cause has been receding in the minds of these uh, players, particularly the Arab states. So this in total makes the regional state, a regional system of the Middle East, uh, Middle East. So we can have a particular visualization of this system. It's not completely abstract. Now, the most important question, is Iran the spoiler of the system? Uh, if you could see these uh, four features in the, in the back slide, these four features, and the four features that I have mentioned here, Iran does not approve, are the same. So I'm not saying whether it is a spoiler, but it will imply, okay, it will imply the same, because Iran does not approve that this region is predominantly, uh, predominantly uh, you know, belonging to the Arab states. One example is that the, the Persian Gulf, the, the, the Gulf that in, in general we talk about, which is surrounded by eight states, six countries of GCC, Iran and Iraq. There's a lot of a struggle between the Arab states and Iran, whether to call it the Persian Gulf or whether to call it uh, the Arab Gulf. Iran says, me too, manham, in Persian it says that I am also there, I am also present. Let us count me as well. That is the whole uh, crux of the fight that is happening in that region. So Iran crushes this notion that this region is predominantly belonging to the Arab states. 
Now, preeminence of the US power. This is where this, this notion of geopolitics is very important. Iran says that this is our region. So the regional issues should be solved by the regional players. And the geopolitics of this region is the concern of the players of this region. But the US says the sea is also there included in the geopolitics. So I can go into the high seas and reach up to the shore as far as it is international waters. This is where you see all of conflicts. Just recently, you may have seen uh, the manless you know, flotilla and Iranians uh, tussle with the US Marine. So this definition of geopolitics that the seas are also included gives US a lot of leeway in reaching offshore in a legitimate fashion. And this is the crux of the fight between Iran and the United States in terms of the handling of this particular Middle East region. Now, the third feature is securitization of the region. I have not written it, but it is the elephant in the room, Iran. So the security is supposedly being protected by the threat of Iran. Of course, it will not be to the lacking of the Iranians, right? So of course, it crushes that notion also. Now, when it comes to re receding relevance of Palestine and Quite recently, the tangible form of it has been given by Abraham Accord. Iran tarnishes this concept and says that those are the traitors who have been going towards normalizing tides. We all know Iran's standing on Israel, right? Which is not particularly good. So Iran has been tarnishing all these notions, which is what is made, uh, which, uh, which is what makes the system. So this is for all, all of us to conclude that, of course, Iran is a spoiler. Is it a good spoiler or a bad spoiler? I, I leave that unto you to decide. Now, that was understanding the whole region in terms of these four features, which is a reductionist approach to understand in our research field. But of course, there are many, many other variables. Uh, so these are some more variables through which we can understand the changing dynamics. So there is a system which I said that is constituted by these four features. And there is a power that is Iran, as I said, has been challenging that. So of course, there are some changes ha happening, right? So this is a list of those changes. Uh, just a bit of background about two, that this uh, particular uh, system, uh, we may call it the post-Cold War outlook, uh, because it was after the, the end of the Cold War that the liberal system was created, which is where the U.S. got a preeminent role, which I have not mentioned here. But of course, U.S. is important. The second point is it got the all-pervasive power after the Russia or USSR got absented. Now, in terms of the changing dynamic, we see these are the keywords we always hear or read about them in the newspapers. Those events, which is Gulf War, in fact, two of them, then the Arab Spring happened, then conflicts in Syria, Yemen, and Libya. I've just mentioned them because of the paucity of time, but you can understand that Iran is involved in many of these uh, issues, or is being discussed as part, of, as part of many of these issues. So we'll have to look in these broader issues, what exactly is the role of Iran? Some of them uh, give you the impression that Iran has been challenging the system. <clears throat> now we see that, uh, and we talk about US receding role from the Middle East. So that is the most important change that has happened. So uh, there are some skeptics, they think that no, it's not changing its role, or there are some who say that, yes, it is changing. I see there is a very important uh, cause for U.S. to change its role. Even if I say that it's not completely withdrawing, there is a very important factor that is the U.S. shale gas revolution. Okay, and uh, whenever we have been talking since our maybe early days about Middle East, we have always been focusing on oil. So it's very understandable the U.S. is interested in the region for oil. So if, if it has more of it of its own, then it is very common sensical that it will have less and less interest. So that's why this important point, the US gas revolution has been making some changes in terms of US behavior in the region. And that will have the reciprocal behavior in terms of the behavior of Saudi Arabia, which has been an ally of US 
uh, Qatar, and of course, Iran, which has been making, having an enmity relationship of enmity. Then there are some other uh, pointers like Iraq and Afghanistan wars that happened that made a lot of changes. As far as Iran is important, uh, as far as Iran is concerned, these two events were epochal in nature in, 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 in Iranian history because one is these two are do, two sides of Iran, right? So US has been coming closer to the border of Iran. That was very important for Iran, these two events. So it devised its own strategy to counter that particular fix in which it found itself. Okay. And then later on, as I said, the shale gas revolution in this both both regions, now US has been trying to withdraw. Okay. And of course, one reason attached to it is its policy of pivot to Asia, because US now sees that oil is not as majorly a reason for me to be embedded in that region as the challenges of my superpower position, that is China. So it's been uh, shifting. It's been long that it's been trying, but it was quite entangled in that region since Obama time, it, it, uh, US was trying. Now it's going further ahead with that policy. So its resources are limited, so it has to recalibrate its resources. Okay, so the next point is also related, the US withdrawal of Afghanistan, and of course, it's decreasing footprints. These are all good for, for Iran, right? And uh, if you see that uh, the US uh, withdrawal or US change in policy in the Middle East is not happening in isolation. Uh, whenever you read about a JCPOA or Iran nuclear deal, Iranian nuclear negotiation, uh, the Iranian nuclear talks started with the US at the time when it had paused its pivot to Asia policy. So these two are linked. And these two are, again, commonsensical that US is very powerful, but still it has finite resources. So it has been trying to lessen its burden in the Middle East by having some kind of, you know, uh, some improvement in the relationship with, with Iran, uh, with which it is entangled at many uh, junctures. So that is how Iranian nuclear talk started. And uh, then again, there was domestic politics in the US which derailed that particular scheme. And now it has been revived under uh, President Biden. So whenever we read about JCPOA, it's all linked with this changing dynamics. It's not only about nuclear non-proliferation. It's about the geopolitics of the Middle East. It's about this changing dynamics. And of course, the underlying factor here for US as a matter of concern is that there are two powers, China and Russia, which have been challenging its preeminent position, right? Russia, Henry Kissinger has said that uh, even if after the dissolution of USSR, we must take Russia seriously. Nobody heard him, now they are hearing him, <laughs> okay, that Russia is preeminent power. But yes, in the national security strategy documents in the US, the US has always maintained that uh, and uh, in the last uh, few years, it has been uh, writing that these two are revisionist powers. Okay, so if I write an article, somebody revises it, I may not like it. So this is the draft template of the regional system that has been written by the US. So somebody is revising it. These Russia and China are revising, they wouldn't like it. Okay, so how much of it, uh, how much of the revision would US like to go that is important to understand, and that is a changing uh, dynamic, you know, that's in flux. So, so far we have understood the broad uh, dynamics. Let's now uh, focus more at a micro level on Iran's foreign policy, because uh, my part is exclusively focused on, on Iran. So I have given a very brief uh, description of how to understand Iran's outlook of the world, right? We all understand uh, the other's uh, description of Iran. That is quite widely available. So I have tried here to give how Iran looks at the world, because only then we can understand, even if we do not approve, uh, why Iran has been behaving in a particular manner. So there are three uh, periods that can be identified in Iran's poli uh, foreign policy history since Islamic Revolution of 1979. The first one is, these are my terminologies, so one may dispute, but it is for our own understanding as academics. 
these are not watertight terminologies, expansionist phase, the first phase, which I have period, given period of 1979, that is the start of revolution until 1989, which coincided with uh, the leader of first leader, Ayatollah Khomeini, and also the end of, uh, very near to the end of Iran-Iraq war of eight years. Okay, so uh, after 1979 revolution, the world was worried by Islamic revolution because of this factor, so we cannot negate it. If there is some change, political change in a particular country, it shouldn't bother too much to the outsiders. But this angle of export of revolution, that was the problem, problematic area for the world. So this was a particular uh, period. And when Iran, Iraq, Iraq, Iran calls it an imposed war, which is true that Iran did not start that war with Iraq, but uh, eventually it, when it was ending, Iran was having uh, an upper hand. But because of the outside pressure, Ayatollah Khomeini had to retreat. It had to sign a treaty, right? Not a treaty, but of course, it, he had to recede uh, back down. So that was a very important juncture of Iranian history. And also eight years of Iran-Iraq war had put in a lot of economic pressure. That is what caused it to change its policy, foreign policy. That's what I call a period of restraint, 89 to 2001. So we don't see much happening in terms of you know, international uh, relations, uh, just the effect of Iran, Iraq. So a lot of domestic churning happening. Khomeini's death happened and then the transition of the leadership happened. Mr. Khamenei, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei came. Then this period ended with again, uh, a world renowned event of 9-11, that is September 11, uh, uh, terrorist attacks on the United States, which brought US fully into the region. Okay, so after that, uh, uh, Iran had slight cooperation because they, they were the Sunni, you know, uh, people who were the perpetrators. So a Shia state, Ira Iran was seen as slightly, you know, helpful. So in Afghanistan, Iran and US did cooperate briefly. Then the other genie of uh, controversy erupted. Uh, in August 2002, first time we heard about Iranian clandestine, supposedly clandestine nuclear program. So this whole thing, you know, changed the U.S. policy towards Iran. It is now started looking at Iran with a lot of skepticism. That brief period of cooperation ended, and of course, we heard about, in a, articulated by the president himself of the United States, axis of evil, Iran being a part of that. Okay, then later on, uh, attack on Afghanistan, Iraq. As I said, it happened, and then the problems that was created for Iran. Uh, in terms of U.S. coming closer, it devised a policy to protect itself. This is what I have named politics of proxy, because it was fighting an asymmetric war with the superpower, both on both of its borders. Okay, so it devised a policy, and uh, uh, that we may term as politics of proxy. So wherever these, uh, uh, you know, domestic powers were there, who could support Iran? like, you know, in Lebanon, in Syria, right? Uh, even in Iraq, those people were quoted by the Iranians and they came handy in Iranian fight uh, with this superpower and of course the regional uh, players. And there are two, just to mention, give it a complete look, uh, Arab Spring and the phenomenon of ISIS, which again uh, has, a, a, I mean, where again, Iran has a lot of, uh, uh, role to play because these are linked with Syria, you know, and uh, U.S. fight against terrorism. Mm -hmm. Then there's one final point that I have mentioned, which is evolving in nature, Ukraine, Russia war, and JCPOA. I have mentioned a little bit about JCPOA, but Ura Ukraine, Russia war, these are important because we have heard about some reports about Iran supplying, you know, drones to Russia. So we have to keep watching uh, these issues, how Iran behaves and what will be the implication. So the next two slides are simply a backgrounder uh, of my next speaker's talk, just to uh, attach these two uh, countries together, Iran, Turkey relations. So he will be getting into the, uh, the, the politics uh, uh, of, of it in, in, in depth. So these are some of the uh, you know, points of convergence between Iran and Turkey. You can have a look at it. They're both uh, neighbor state, that's important. Uh, 
there is a lot of uh, cautious approach in terms of the link because they have been competing on various platforms and they are also cooperating. So it's again not a watertight compartment. They have deep, because they are neighbors, deep trading investment relations. On Palestinian issue, some sort of convergence is there. And the uh, Kurdish uh, issue is very important because of uh, Turkey's uh, territorial integrity. So there also they have some kind of uh, cooperation. This last slide, and that is uh, the points of divergences. Uh, the energy uh, is, is one important factor because uh, the transportation, Turkey wants to play an important role. Iran mm -hmm. is a major player already. So the next is the Arab Spring and the aftermath of it, the changes that is happening in the social and political field. They have some divergences of opinion. Of course, because of their internal uh, you know, uh, or in internal um, uh, reasons. Then, of course, regional Shia Sunni tension that is happening there, uh, uh, Turkey doesn't see as in its own interest. Of course, it wouldn't. Then the Turkish, uh, you know, the terrorist groups that has been uh, uh, coming up, uh, how to fight with them. So they are internal dynamics. So these are the some some of them. So with this, I. Uh, Thank you all for being a patient a listener. I hope I have been uh, able to clarify some of the notions related to Iran. Now I hand over the talk to my uh, colleague, Joy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Asif, uh, for this uh, uh, very exhaustive and interesting uh, lecture on Iran. Uh, I uh, have to say that uh, I'm very grateful to you for talking about uh, about Turkey as well, uh, because uh, something I wanted to touch upon. Um, Turkey is in many ways historically tied to Iran. Um, I would wish only to say that uh, Every great empire has its uh, uh, heyday, its uh, most opulent period in history. For Iran, this was in antiquity, because as we know, Iran's greatness has uh, at least temporarily diminished with the Arab conquest. Uh, Iran uh, became a constituent of first the Umayyad and the Abbasid Empire. And then uh, after the Mongol conquest, it remained dormant as an independent political force until the arrival of the Safavids, who turned Iran again into a great power. However, this was also in conjunction with Turkey. And let me talk about this in some detail. But first, let's have a look at the map of Turkey, because it's very instructive to look at uh, how uh, Turkey's uh, geopolitical position has determined its policies uh, both in the uh, in the times of empire and uh, in the times of republic. What is a given is that Turkey straddles two continents, and it's in this sense it is a very unique country. I there are very few countries that lie on two continents, if if any. At uh, at any rate, we see that uh, currently Turkey's European part is rather small, but it comprises part of Istanbul. And uh, most of Turkey uh, today lies in Asia. Um, this, of course, would uh, make us believe that Turkey's characteristics are more Asian than European, but I think this is a very bold and probably uh, untrue conclusion. What I also wish to call your attention to is the fact that Turkey is not just a land power, but a sea power also. Let's not forget that Turkey has a very important portion of the East Mediterranean coastline, and it has a major portion of the Black Sea coastline. And what is even more important, that in between there are the Straits. Now, who commands the Straits is a major global geopolitical question. And we have seen this recently. We never thought that the Montreal Agreement concluded in 1936 would again have such an importance. And we have seen it. 
that Turkey very resolutely blocked the passage of Russian warships into the Black Sea for obvious reasons, because it was in the, the current conflict against its interest to see a preponderance of Russian power uh, in a sea uh, which is of vital importance for Turkey. But uh, for a second, uh, let's also look at uh, Turkey's many neighbors. Uh, Turkey, quite astonishingly, has uh, two important neighbors uh, in the Arab world, uh, being uh, Syria and Iraq. And it has um, a highly important historic neighbor, uh, Iran. Uh, also, it has its uh, uh, Caucasian uh, uh, neighbor, uh, Georgia, of uh, similar importance. And it borders also on Armenia. On the Western side, uh, it is bordering on Bulgaria and Greece, two countries that have previously belonged uh, under the aegis of the Ottoman Empire. And with this, let me proceed uh, a little bit into history because we cannot fully understand modern Turkey without looking at Turkey's past. Turkey was a world power. There is no question that Turkey was not only a world power, but a defining world power, and essentially the only power that could stand up uh, to uh, its contemporary, contemporary European rivals, primarily the Habsburg Empire. Um, strangely, at the same period of the Middle Ages, beginning with Turkey's heyday after the conquest of uh, Byzantium uh, and the establishment of Istanbul as capital of Imperial Turkey. Turkey fought a two-front war uh, for uh, two centuries, and these two fronts were the European front, where it battled the Habsburgs uh, in Hungary, and on the Eastern front, it battled the Safavids of Iran. Very few people know that there was an attempt by the Habsburg Empire and the Kingdom of Hungary to link up with the Safavids uh, to uh, essentially uh, bring Turkey to its heels uh, during the Ottoman period. However, this, uh, uh, this attempt failed, not least because the Hungarian ambassador who took the letter of uh, Emperor Rudolf uh, to his, uh, to his Safavid counterpart died of dysentery when he arrived to Iran. So the diplomatic mission was a failure. Of course, this was not the only reason, but it is interesting and instructive to know that the history of Turkey and Iran and Europe are connected on this very interesting point. What is more important is that uh, Turkey ruled the entire Middle East. This was in the form of a caliphate. And this Islamic caliphate, headed by the Sultan of Turkey from the 16th century onward, had its projections not only on the Middle East, but the entire Islamic world. And it's very interesting to see how in Malaysia today, uh, the manuscripts uh, of uh, the uh, 16th, 17th century uh, are talking uh, not just about uh, the caliphate with its capital in Istanbul, but how the different sultans were asking for fermans from the Turkish sultan to legitimize their rule. And this uh, was the norm all across the Islamic world. So Turkey was indeed the center of a world empire. And uh, this, of course, until today, uh, put its mark on Turkey's politics. The First World War uh, came with a, a major shock for Turkey because uh, it, to its great misfortune, allied with the Central Powers. And uh, uh, the end of the war uh, not only saw Turkey uh, as uh, a loser of the war, but it had to suffer a major uh, uh, defeat at the hands of Allied armies which not only satisfied themselves with a battlefield victory, but tried to dismantle Turkey as a country. Uh, they succeeded only to the extent of separating Turkey 
from its former Arab realm. We are well aware that the so-called Arab revolt instigated by uh, uh, Lawrence uh, and uh, the uh, British Foreign and Commonwealth Office succeeded in turning uh, uh, the Arab powers of the day against Turkey. And Turkey remained alone uh, and had to cope with a very difficult situation of economic collapse uh, and uncertainty after the First World War. And had it not been for this gentleman in the picture, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, a genius officer of the uh, Turkish army and a great patriot, Turkey would have perhaps uh, shrunk to uh, being a small state in uh, Anatolia. Um, however, uh, Atatürk, together with a dedicated number of his fellow army officers, turned the tide, uh, stopped the, the uh, Allied forces, uh, conquered them, and uh, in the process, he established Turkey as a modern state. Turkey has undergone uh, sweeping reforms at the hand of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. As it is said, Atatürk single-handedly pulled uh, Turkey into the 20th, 20th century from the Middle Ages. He made the Latin script mandatory instead of the Arabic script. He uh, ended the dervish orders. He mandated the wearing of uh, uh, Western clothing, and he modernized the Turkish language. For your information, the Turkish court until uh, the uh, 19th century spoke Persian because Persian was the language of culture and uh, refinement uh, in uh, that part of the world uh, during the Middle Ages. So Turkey uh, has seen a real renaissance under Atatürk uh, and strengthened its position after the First World War. Uh, be, became recognized, widely recognized as a middle power and made the extremely wise decision of staying away from the Second World War, uh, saving itself another catastrophe. After the Second World War, Turkey has joined the Western alliance, not least because it has perceived the threat of the Soviet Union as an existential threat. And with Turkey becoming a member of NATO, its political trajectory was of course uh, drawn up. And I have to say that uh, Turkey's NATO membership until today, regardless of uh, some twists and turns, is the defining characteristics of Turkish foreign policy. Uh, enter uh, the new age uh, with uh, the arrival of um, uh, um, very interesting and dynamic phase of Turkish modernization. Uh, Turkey has uh, very uh, strenuously labored to catch up with uh, the industrialized Western countries and uh, in the process has attained uh, important successes. Evidently, uh, Turkey uh, as a key NATO country uh, was very strongly influenced by its army. The army was a core player in Turkish politics and uh, uh, to the extent that not only it uh, seated and unseated prime ministers, but for a brief period, even the army seized political power in Turkey. Uh, this, however, uh, soon ended and Turkey gradually became an established uh, parliamentary democracy. Uh, it has attained uh, uh, amazing uh, progress in its economy and it has become uh, a major power uh, in its region of the world. Uh, I have to say that the Turkish modernization, strange enough, ran parallel with the Iranian modernization. And for your information, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk and Reza Shah of Iran were close friends, and they had very similar concepts about modernization. While Turkey modernized and became uh, an important uh, uh, power uh, in its region, Iran became the dominant power of uh, the Middle East, as we know, uh, a major uh, military power enjoying part uh, of the United States and being in very close coordination with Israel. However, uh, changes in Turkey also occurred. 
um, the role of the army was slowly diminished and uh, civilian politics took the reign. Uh, this has, of course, uh, made Turkey more and more covetous of becoming a fully recognized European country. Sadly, the European Union have, was hesitant in dealing with Turkey's request for a membership, and I think this is something the European Union should deeply regret today. However, uh, Turkey, uh, after being uh, on several occasions um, refused or delayed in its membership quest, decided to go it alone. Turkish modernization took very bold turns, and Turkey, relying on its own power, uh, on its uh, inventiveness, and also on its very close ties uh, with uh, those uh, rich Arab countries that proved to be major source of foreign direct investment, has made amazing strides in modernization. And here we arrive um, to a stage where we are talking about modern Turkey. Uh, I think uh, if uh, Turkey of the reform age was defined by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, uh, then we can safely say that uh, Turkey of uh, modernity is defined by another politician, uh, Mr. Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Mr. Erdogan has uh, risen to prominence after being the mayor of Istanbul, and his party, the AK party, AK means white in uh, uh, Turkish as a reference to the party's uh, integrity, uh, uh, after many uh, uh, affairs of corruption before in Turkish politics. This Justice and Development Party espoused uh, uh, policy of uh, modernization, but not necessarily on strictly European, Western European principles, but um, heavily reliant on Turkey's imperial tradition and heavily reliant on uh, Turkey's Islamic tradition. This uh, combination uh, brought to Turkey uh, the uh, accusation, quote unquote, of being a neo Ottoman power. I think uh, it's uh, very difficult. Uh, to judge this definition. What is beyond any doubt is that Turkey tries to uh, find solace and energy in its Ottoman past. How did uh, the uh, government, uh, rather governments, headed consecutively by Mr. Erdogan and his AK party, deal uh, with Turkey's environment? This is the next stage of what I want to talk to you about. Evidently, uh, Turkey's major uh, adversary uh, since its NATO membership uh, was uh, the Soviet bloc. With the demise of the Soviet Union, priorities have changed. Turkey has become uh, more concerned about its neighborhood other than Russia, and therefore it looked uh, uh, more closely at its Middle Eastern environment. This is the time when Turkey initiated the so-called zero problems with neighbors policy. This was a very intelligent transactional policy uh, under the aegis of Mr. Erdogan and uh, um, uh, essentially uh, also um, executed by uh, Foreign Minister and then Prime Minister Davut Olu, a very, very highly talented uh, and respected diplomat. Zero problem with neighbors was uh, a success because it not only eliminated frictions with Turkey's southern neighborhood, primarily Syria, Iraq, uh, uh, and uh, to some extent, those countries of the Gulf that uh, may, may have been uh, less intent to do business with Turkey, but also brought in very significant investment from the Gulf countries. We uh, might have forgotten that Turkey was a major contributor to Gulf modernization. Turkish uh, labor was very significant contributor to the construction of the Gulf. Um, Turkey's uh, policy had a lot of dividends, but it was untenable due to the dramatic changes that happened in the Middle East. And at the uh, moment when the so-called Arab Spring uh, 
has uh, appeared on the horizon, Turkey had to reconsider whether it can really protect its national security and interest within the confines of the zero problem with neighbors policy. Of course, it could not. I will jump a few, um, uh, a few slides. Uh, I wanted to show you a portrait of Mr. Erdogan. And uh, subsequently, we arrive to the Syrian spring, a major shock for Turkey, because uh, after a period when it saw its neighborhood stable, suddenly it confronted a totally different and new situation, which was a national security threat to Turkey, and also uh, boded ill for Turkey's plans to involve uh, more closely Arab economies in its dealings. Um, this uh, very tragic situation in Turkey, uh, in uh, Syria, has prompted Turkey to stand behind uh, the revolution, and uh, of course the consequence was uh, uh, the souring and then the break off of relations with Damascus. A similar and uh, oh, similarly dramatic turn of events came around when Egypt rose against President Mubarak. And uh, Turkey again uh, decided to uh, ride with the tide and was sympathetic to the Egyptian revolution and even more sympathetic to the arrival of um, government uh, headed by Mr. Morsi, a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, whose philosophy of power and of the future of not just Egypt, but the Islamic world was very close to the philosophy of Mr. Erdogan and the AK Party. Um, similarly, Turkey was uh, in a difficult situation to decide how to proceed on Libya. I have mentioned that Turkey is a Mediterranean power. What happens in the Mediterranean will inevitably concern the security of Turkey. And because of Libya's very unique position, uh, not just as uh, one of the uh, countries of the Mediterranean with the longest coastline, but also as a major energy source, uh, Turkey saw its interest to uh, side with the uh, government of Tripoli after Gaddafi's fall, which had a markedly Islamist trend. Some called it a Muslim Brotherhood government, which is, I think, uh, uh, an overshoot. However, it was and it remains to be a government uh, very closely tied to political Islam. Turkey invested energy and invested military force in protecting this government against uh, an onslaught of its rivals who were uh, strictly opposed to political Islam and wanted to unite the country under the aegis uh, of the eastern side of Libya, uh, which is uh, Cyrenaica. This situation in Libya has finally broke the camel's back and confronted Turkey with its rivals in the Arab world, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, who were stringently refusing uh, to see a political Islam coming to power anywhere. This very interesting situation, of course, also applied to other players in the Gulf, and uh, Turkey sought a natural alliance with the only country at the time among the Gulf nations that openly espoused political Islam, Qatar. Of course, uh, when uh, push came to shove and uh, Qatar came under uh, blockade by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates for its consistent support of political Islam, Turkey stood behind Qatar to the extent of uh, positioning a, a military base in the country. Um, evidently, uh, this situation uh, where Turkey took sides in a very uh, difficult uh, uh, political conflict in the Gulf also had an effect on Turkey's other political commitments. I have to say that Turkey, uh, even though a secular country by definition, wanted to use its Islamic credentials to forward its political aims in the entire Islamic world. And this same uh, trend has been significant in Central Asia, the backyard of Turkey, where uh, the 
fragmentation of the former Soviet Union gave birth to a significant number of successor states that were uh, quite uh, uh, quite uh, uh, unaware of how they will be coping with the problems that the region has seen. Uh, definitely, there was a, a struggle of influence uh, in a political vacuum between the three major powers with effect on the region, uh, Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Turkey, uh, in this um, political competition, maybe I should uh, stop short of calling it a struggle, has uh, relied very heavily on the pan-Turkism, uh, a political movement originating in the 1930s in Turkey and uh, uh, earmarked by the name of Ziya Gökalp. This uh, movement called for the uniting of all Turkic-speaking peoples of Central Asia uh, under the aegis of Turkey. Uh, this political movement has taken shape in the formation of the so-called Turkic Council, uh, which is inevitably um, uh, seen as uh, one of the uh, forms of uh, rallying Turkic-speaking people, both against Iranian expansion and Russian influence by Turkey. Turkey is playing a significant role in this sense, and I think that Turkey's uh, presence in Central Asia will remain uh, a given that will be definitely having a very profound effect on the future of the area. Now, we arrive uh, to uh, our our current times when, uh, again, the major threat to Turkey's security would not come from the south or from the east, but from the north. The war that Mr. Putin unleashed against the Ukraine has created a wholly new geopolitical situation. It has reinforced uh, uh, the um, um, Turkish uh, allegiance to NATO. Turkey, of course, is not entirely relying on uh, military or uh, military economic power in its uh, um, very uh, difficult current situation when it is now uh, bordering on a war uh, with uh, terrible regional consequences. It is also trying uh, to make do with what it can, diplomacy, uh, opening a corridor for NATO also towards Russia, but also intent on seeing the uh, triangle of Iran, Russia, and Turkey arriving at a modicum of minimum cooperation over regional issues. The three leaders, as you remember, met recently in Tehran and came to some basic agreements on how they shaped the region in this coming very uh, difficult phase. Turkey, however, uh, has a very principled and laudable position on Ukraine because uh, it has provided material support, logistic and military support to Ukraine against the Russian aggression, which it called an aggression. However, at the same time, maintaining a dialogue with Russia. I, this is invaluable, not just for NATO, but also, as we have seen through the grain agreement clenched by Turkey for uh, the entire Middle East and beyond. Uh, I have to say that this merits to be mentioned as one of the major foreign policy successes of Turkey. And I have to say that it's also a major humanitarian contribution, uh, which uh, has to be recognized. Uh, I think we arrived uh, to uh, one uh, very important point. I wanted to show you the picture of the Turkic uh, uh, summit, which was held in Istanbul. Uh, and I have to again uh, go back to history for a second when I talk about the very difficult relationship between Russia and Turkey. Uh, Turkey uh, is a very cautious player and it has always been a, a master in diplomacy and foreign policy when it came to protecting its interests. This uh, poster I have found uh, uh, depicting uh, 
uh, very interesting uh, situation uh, during the First World War when Russia was willing to occupy Istanbul, uh, reestablish its hold over the entirety of the Balkans, and um, uh, essentially uh, make Turkey a secondary power, which it has failed to do. I think uh, the specter of uh, this uh, history is hanging uh, darkly over Russia and uh, uh, Turkey. I will want to say that, of course, uh, without uh, exaggerating the dangers that uh, Russia poses to Turkey, a NATO member, we have to acknowledge that what goes on today in Ukraine has a major impact on Turkish national security. And therefore, Turkey has come much closer to NATO than it was before. This is a picture of Mr. Erdogan at one of the latest NATO summits. And Turkey uh, acceded to the request of Finland and Sweden to join uh, NATO. Finally, I would say that all this comes at a time when Turkey is patching up with all its neighbors. And uh, it was one of the signal moments of this process when Mohammed bin Salman visited uh, Mr. Erdogan in Istanbul, ending uh, a very uh, dangerous and um, uh, uh, very well publicized spat between the two countries. I would want to say that uh, a factor that nobody in the region should forget is that the strongest army of the region is Turkey's army and uh, how Turkey wields its power uh, will be one of the decisive uh, and formative uh, uh, contributors to the future of the area. Uh, I would want to say that uh, Turkey has, in my opinion, an indispensable stabilizing role in its region, uh, which has uh, serious uh, implications, not for uh, Central Asia, the Caucasus, but also for the entirety of the Middle East. Let us hope that the Turkey's great energy will be uh, uh, conducted in a way as to contribute to peace and stability in the region. And uh, let me just say that Turkey, of course, uh, can be judged from uh, several angles, depending on who beholds Turkey and under uh, uh, about circumstances, but we should say that Turkey's role in the Middle East remains a defining role. Uh, if we strike the balance, I dare say that Turkey's contribution to peace and stability uh, in the region was more than what others would call a role of meddling uh, in the wider region. And uh, let us hope that uh, Turkey could also be uh, one of the contributors to ending the terrible war that is raging now in Ukraine. Uh, being the only NATO country on speaking terms with Russia now, I think Turkey has a very important duty in the future. And let us hope that it will be able to comply with the duty. Thank you very much. And uh, excuse me for being so lengthy. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gorgi and Asif for a very comprehensive and insightful overview of the role of Iran uh, and Turkey in shaping and influencing the geopolitics and competition in the Middle East. Um, now um, we open the floor for the questions. Um, uh, I will start with questions from the room first, and then we will go to the questions uh, from Zoom. Okay, Misha. Um, please wait for the mic. Can you introduce yourself and then say the question? Hello, I'm Misha. Thank you so much for your question. I was going to ask about Soleimani's uh, assassination. Did it have any kind of long-term effect on uh, Iran's military leadership and in how they saw their ability to defend themselves and their country against foreign aggression. Shall we take another question and then, well, thank you, Misha. Um, do we have another question? Jean Lo, please.
OK. Uh, is, is it working? Yeah. Uh, so Jean-Luc Saman from the... Should I... Or should I... OK, I'll, I'll sit. Uh, so Jean-Luc Saman, a senior uh, research fellow here at the, the Institute. And uh, uh, the question on Soleimani uh, made me uh, uh, think of my question. I was uh, thinking about waiting, but I, th I think it's related because I, I had a question also on the... Um, on Asif's view of the nature of the regime uh, in Iran, because the view generally is that this is a religious uh, regime with a messianic uh, messianic agenda and so on. But more and more over the, the last two decades, what we've seen is the strengthening of the uh, the revolutionary guards. And my question is, are we misled when we see Iran as a religious regime? when it might actually be more and more a uh, military militaristic regime with the IRGC being the the primary uh, operator when we come, when it comes to uh, the biggest issues such as the nuclear program the proxy warfare in the middle east and so on so just a, a question which is uh, in a way very related to the first one which is uh, is it uh, uh, in terms of nature of the regime more towards a military regime, and maybe it will be even more after Khamenei uh, dies. So uh, your views on that. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, first your question about, uh, although both are related, but specifically uh, about what you asked. Uh, See, uh, Iran has never trusted the United States, right? So uh, there have been uh, uh, historical reasons, uh, and which has actually helped Iranian Iranian you know government or its leaders uh, to emphatically convince their own population that the foreign policy that they have been pursuing there is a reason behind that. Okay, uh, Qasem Soleimani uh, uh, actually that helped Ayatollah Khamenei in <clears throat> proving that point because uh, <clears throat> see uh, arab spring uh, sorry isis the phenomenon of isis that is very important in june uh, 2014 uh, when uh, when when it started uh, they uh, uh, you know declared the caliphate so it's a sunni regime which is going to topple the whole of the world i mean this was the the fear so in this, the Sunni uh, rule, among the, in the scheme of Sunni uh, rulers, what is the position of the Shia population? So it was not only ISIS phenomena was not only a threat for the rulers of Iran, it was uh, a threat uh, to the population, the whole of population. Uh, during the time of ISIS, before that, the Iranian people would chant on the streets of Tehran, uh, Mark Bar America, Mark Bar uh, Israel, you know. Uh, since 2014, the, the chant changed completely. They would chant Mark Bar Daesh, that is ISIS. It became a bigger threat than, than Israel and the US. Now, uh, General Qasim Soleimani was seen and actually it, he played a very important role in suppressing that phenomena that is, is right so uh, uh because of the proxy or the extraterritorial uh, uh activities that iran had he was on the front of it so the iran iran uh, the play the role that it played he was on the front right so uh, he was also positively seen by the people not the way uh, president trump had uh, been been looking at it so his killing was a, a big mistake, a uh, political mistake on parts of the United States. Uh, it, it showed uh, 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 less understanding of the Iranian polity. Uh, he was a man, but he was holding a position. It further strengthened uh, IRGC. Now I'll come to, my, uh, to your question. What is IRGC? Uh, in the whole scheme of uh, Iranian uh, uh, political system, IRGC is not uh, an army of the state. It's the army of the supreme leader. There's a duality in Iran of everything. It is Islamic and Republic, right? 
it's a script you can see. It's like Arabic script, but Persian language, you know. Um, the Nowruz is the most important uh, festival, but it's an Islamic state. Similarly, it has a dual system of um, military also. One that is Artesh, which is the traditional military, which is supposed to defend the territory of Iran. The other is IRGC. You know, it is supposed to primarily uh, defend. How, how, how I say that uh, the ruler, because it is supposed to protect the Islamic revolution, okay. Uh, which is uh, what is, uh, you know, uh, protected by the supreme leader. So indirectly, it's actually protecting the ruler of Iran. So the strengthening of this particular aspect of the military of Iran strengthened whom? The, the leader, the ruler of Iran. It was a mistake. We can see again, uh, as I said, about the finite resources. Everything is not finite, but the resources are finite. Iran, again, the economic constraint that it has domestically, especially because of sanctions. When the fund is allotted between Artesh and IRGC, so there's a lot of internal tussle there also in the political system. Internal debate, you will find whether to give this fund to IRGC, whether it is fair, whether it is not. Everything was legitimized. You know, because we have to make it more, you know, robust. We have to make it stronger. There's a th direct threat, right? So it made the ruler stronger, if not the state, the killing of Qasim Soleimani, which is what was against, against the whole, you know, scheme of the, the American policymaker or led by Donald Trump. So this is to answer both of your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Sif. Um, do we have another question from the room? From from Zoom? I would like to make a comment. Okay, please. Uh, My short comment is an apology because I realized that during my narrative, I did not use the proper name for Turkey, which is Turkey. And therefore, I apologize from all my distinguished Turkish viewers if I offended them. But unfortunately, it's very difficult for me to accommodate to the new name. And I think all of us will find it uh, difficult in the beginning to identify with a new name. As all of you know, Turkey requested, Turkey requested then the name change from the United Nations um, at the beginning of this year or maybe the end of last year. And uh, it's ongoing. So uh, I, I wish to renew my apologies, uh, should anyone have been offended. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, uh, Gorky. Um, so OK, um, right. Can you introduce yourself, please? Hi. Uh, my name is Iftikhar Bashar. I'm from RSIS. My question to uh, Dr. Shuja is, uh, um, we often hear that there is a nexus between Al-Qaeda and Iran, uh, in a sense that uh, Iran has sheltered some of its leaders. And also, uh, Iran, uh, to some extent, Iran is also, Iran was also uh, supportive to, to uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan. In, in a way, they wanted U.S. to leave the, the, that region. So ca can you please elaborate a bit on that, like why Iran, in spite of being a um, Sunni, uh, in a, a Shia country or, or, or following Shia ideology, how, why they're sort of um, maintaining a relation, a, a relation between, uh, relation with the Sunni uh, uh, terrorist groups? Uh, thank you so much uh, for your question. Uh, again, it uh, brings us all in the realm of the politics of proxy that I had mentioned in my presentation. And uh, Iran did because uh, the Sunni doctrines uh, that was espoused by Taliban or uh, you know, Al-Qaeda, that was quite in antagonism with what the Shia people you know, um, uh, stand for. So it was a very natural thing that Shia Iran 
uh, would be an enemy to that particular uh, you, you know force. Uh, but that's all always you know calculated in the interest broader aspect of interest of this state. So Iran did cooperate. There's no two ways about it with the with the U.S. But after this nuclear genie came up, then the axis of evil expression came up, and the U.S. withdrew uh, with that. Uh, you know, of course, Iran would counter. Iran would say that we withdrew. But as I put it, U.S. distanced that kind of cooperation. Uh, then what happened is that uh, Iran had to find this. This is called hedging. You know, hedging your bet. What would you do? So that was uh, part of that strategy. Uh, people generally say Shia Christian, which is not entirely uh, true. That's why I say uh, that it's a, like a tool in the hands of Iranian uh, leaders uh, to fight this asymmetric war. It's not specific to Shiism, you know. Uh, that's why your question is very important that uh, Al-Qaeda, yeah. So we see the lineage, all those New York reports, you know, New York Times reports, you will see that they started hedging. And since then, we have traces that where they cooperate to the extent that even recently, some of the Al-Qaeda leaders were, uh, you know, alluded to being present in Iran. Uh, so these, these we see. So we can explain that it started hedging. Why it started doing that? Uh, that is another question that uh, might be, you know, related to the U.S. policy, whether it was right or wrong. But about the broader aspects of uh, proxies, it's not only linked to Shia, Shia people, Shia population. It's very important. Uh, that's why this entire concept of uh, the Shia Crescent is not entirely true. Wherever, because Iran is a Shia state, but it has a broader paradigm of being a revolutionary state, and this is Islamic revolution. So you'll have to put in the hierarchy. First is Islam, and Islam brought that revolution. But since 12 were Shiite was the religion of Iran, so that is the religion. It's not Shia Islamic Republic, right? So that gives Iran a lot of leverage, you know, in terms of wooing or courting even the Sunni population. So it does it on the pretext of saving the oppressed people of the world, you know. It always expresses this feeling, oppressed. Otherwise, why would Iran support Palestinians? They are mostly uh, Sunni, right? So uh, that's how it gives Iran a lot of leverage. Why is it uh, that mostly the Shiites are the followers of Iran? Uh, there are two reasons of it. One is that uh, they are mostly in the conflict regions. Most of the conflict, like Syria, you see, Lebanon, you see. In conflicting regions, most of the population is Shia. That's a coincidence. But there's also an, a structural reason for that. Uh, the Iranian leader or the Shiite leader in Shiism, uh, Marja, that is the term of the supreme, you know, um, it's, it's a term related to a hierarchy of ulama or religious leader. So those who will be the religious leader of Iran will also be uh, considered as religious leader people residing outside of the territory of Iran, those who are, who are the followers of Tual were Shiites. So this religious legitimacy actually transcends the boundary in terms of uh, making followers of that particular leader. And since that leader is also a political head of a particular state, so that allegiance also goes there, right? So to answer in short your question, it was part of a strategy. And that is true. What you know is true. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Asif. Um, uh, we do still have uh, 10 minutes. Um, uh, now I'm going to take a, a question from Zoom. Uh, we do have a question from our colleague, Alex, uh, who is a senior research fellow at the Middle East Institute. Uh, he's asking about the effect of Ukraine war on GCBO. Uh, and the question is to ask, uh, if you allow me, I also like wanted to ask, uh, to add to this question, um, you know, um, also on the Russia-Ukraine crisis and the ongoing energy crisis where there is a uh, a consequence of shortages on the energy supplies and high uh, energy prices and how that, you know, have created a competitive advantage for some countries, actually, uh, like the Gulf Arab states, uh, where they are actually bearing the fruits of uh, the windfall of um, high oil prices. Why do we see uh, in within such uh, circumstances that the GCC 
especially the UAE and Saudi Arabia, are restoring diplomatic ties uh, with Iran, where, you know, um, probably maintaining the constraints in Iran could be more beneficial for the Gulf states in such circumstances. Because if we allow Iran, you know, to produce and export oil, maybe the, the prices will go down and then that would affect the region negatively. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Aisha. Uh, uh, yours is a difficult question, so I'll answer later. Let me first answer uh, Alex's question and with a uh, big hello to him. Uh, see, uh, this Ukrainian crisis, uh, um, uh, we all know that uh, it has put a lot of pressure on the energy problem of the Europeans, right? And uh, one fact we often miss is that uh, there are two components of generally energy that we say loosely, that is oil and gas. Uh, if we combine all oil and all gas, Iran stands at number one position, not at two or three or four. Uh, both hydrocarbon like Iran, uh, yeah, oil and gas, Iran is at number one. The whole energy has been, you know, constricted because of the U.S. sanctions. So that is why uh, U.S. is in a fix these days because releasing that energy would uh, uh, reveal, I mean, release a lot of pressure in terms of meeting the needs of the Europeans, right? And uh, uh, it's not 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 just that uh, they are trying to constrict the Russian energy also, right? So uh, the whole of uh, oil that comes from from Iran, uh, you know, that will also put some effect on Iran uh, the the Russian oil also because some countries who have been buying Russian oil, they will be buying uh, the uh, Iranian oil. So of course that is very obvious, and uh, now. Uh, JCPOA is actually a mechanism at that time also when the problems happened related to uh, Syria or ISIS. If you see uh, JCPOA part one and ISIS came at the right, uh, same time. Okay, so uh, this was big giant uh, ISIS, you know, uh, which was seen coming and the US policymakers saw that Iran could be instrumental in checking that. Now nobody gives credit to Iran. That is another matter. But now that genie is no more right. It's very less. So, but again, the other genie has come in terms of uh, various other factors. And major factor of it is the revisionist powers, you know, uh, China and, and Russia. That's why US wants to withdraw from that region and wants to lessen its burden. So it wants to befriend or at least lessen its conflict with, conflict with Iran. So JCPOA, as Alex asked, is that vehicle through which US policymakers can do that. That is why all of the happenings that are taking place in JCPOA are linked to that. It makes a lot of strategic uh, uh, and economic rationale, but it does have problem uh, at two cons. One is uh, the US domestic politics, where two different camps have different opinions. And internationally, US uh, allies in the Middle East, uh, Israel and, you know, and Saudi Arabia, these are the two um, bottlenecks through which US have to pass to achieve or attain its uh, national interest. So uh, uh, what will happen in future? Uh, I think US will eventually try to attain its national interest. Now, uh, coming back to Aisha's uh, question, uh, GCC. Now I'll just uh, put it into two categories. <clears throat> there are economic issues and there are uh, geopolitical or security issues, right? Uh, it makes a lot of economic sense that uh, the biggest provider of this commodity, that is Iran, has been crippled. It makes a lot of economic sense uh, to the Gulf GCC states because they will be the dominant player in the market. That makes a lot of economic sense. Uh, but the security always prevails over economy. Again, that is why I often emphasize very important to understand uh, U.S. requirement to get out of this you know, region. Uh, 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 because it is more self-sufficient uh, in oil and that is enabling that. And then the challenge from, from China, we cannot uh, miss it. Otherwise, we can't explain many of the things that are happening uh, in today's uh, world. So uh, now, US, when it is coming out of the region, and then these Gulf states are realizing that the more and more GSCPO is coming to become a, a reality, 
the less and less US would be committed to their security, right? So uh, these power have been, mostly GCC states have been depending on US security umbrella. They cannot on their own fight Iran. So if they see that that is receding, the best way to lessen that threat is by befriend the enemy or the potential enemy. That is why we see UAE ambassadors, you know, uh, Bahrain, uh, Saudi Arabia, all those powers. It's not that the Cupid has been floating in the air all of a sudden. It's that a strategic reason that there's less dependence or less, less guarantee of the US aid coming. So the APCAC, uh, when you saw the attack on the Saudi oil installations, and even Donald Trump, which was supposed to be so friendly with the with MBS, uh, even he said we would, you know, need to be paid for the the the, the military, uh, you know. So uh, you see, on, on both counts, Republican and Democrats, because it's, it's in U.S. national interest. How they will achieve it? Of course, they will be navigating through those domestic uh, interests also. So to answer in short, Aisha's uh, question. Uh, uh, security uh, uh, issue will prevail over the economic issue. So they are trying to be fair. And that's a good, wise move, you know. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asif. Um, since we don't have another question, I do have another question. And this also builds on security. And also, uh, given my background uh, on climate change uh, affairs, um, I, I also, I build on the point where you mentioned we see convergence and divergence between Iran and Turkey. So for the Middle East, the Middle East is uh, one of the most water stressed regions uh, in the world. Um, and what makes um, the situation more challenging that most of the water uh, is shared between countries. So there's a transboundary water management um, um, issue. Uh, and I can give uh, an example um, of the, you know, um, the Euphrates uh, River actually originates from Turkey and then it goes to Syria uh, until it arrives uh, to Iraq. And then uh, Tigris River originates from Iran and then it goes to Turkey. Um, there was, um, you know, most recently we also like uh, heard about the dust storms uh, in the region. And then there was this incident where Iran was uh, blaming Turkey for the dust storms uh, 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 where Turkey is building an ambitious dam and uh, the Iranian officials claim that the dam is actually leading to drought. Uh, in Iraq, and then uh, therefore um, triggering the dust storms to happen. Um, so, and then also, Gergi, you mentioned that uh, the uh, the Syrian Spring uh, actually creates a, a national security threat for uh, Turkey. Um, so, I think my question is: um, Are we going to see uh, from climate? change point of view, more of a cooperation or conflict between Turkey and Iran and within the Middle East in general? Uh, thank you, Aisha. Uh, see, uh, when we talk about the, the climate change, it's like uh, the ghost which is at a far, far away uh, distance. So uh, normally it's not easy to cooperate on those uh, realms uh, immediately. Uh, but there are some instances where we see uh, uh, the ghost is quite near, like in terms of Iraq and uh, what she mentioned about the sandstorm. Uh, Iraq and Iran have been uh, cooperating. Uh, in fact, there is not much coverage in, in, in the press of that kind of cooperation. Uh, but they are very intensively cooperating. This is one of the best examples of the regional cooperation that Iran and Iraq have been cooperating on the problems emanating from that uh, storm. Uh, in terms of water also, again, uh, you mentioned about Al-Qaeda, Taliban. Uh, this uh, water coming from uh, uh, Afghanistan has a lot of implication on the water system of, uh, of Iran, you know. So um, very important re uh, reason for the two countries to come together, you know. Uh, 
uh, now again, uh, how much of it will be linked to the security aspect or the ideological aspect and how much to the day-to-day -day life. So uh, that is uh, a lot uh, linked. So these uh, uh, issues do play uh, a very important role. Uh, but when multilateral organizations or, uh, you know, many countries get involved, then a lot of politics, international politics also come into play. So at bilateral level, uh, countries are uh, definitely cooperating in terms of Turkey and Iraq and, uh, you know, the water uh, system. I would like to uh, request uh, my colleague Georgi to, uh, you know, uh, focus some uh, uh, light including on the previous question of energy about which you are so sentimental i would like you to add on the energy crisis in uh, caused by ukraine and russia war if you could please add on to these two points thank you thank you i uh, first about the water because uh, you are right aisha this is becoming one of the major environmental and security issues in the region and nothing illustrates this better than uh, tragically what we see today in Iraq, which cannot be separated, is the question of resources. A very rich country, uh, which is struggling to provide basic services to its population, uh, most importantly, to provide them water. And of course, um, the blame game is ongoing. Um, I have to say that certainly the upstream countries, both Iran and Turkey, have a major responsibility in how many uh, million cubic meters would reach the downstream countries. But this cannot be separated from the intelligent use of water, of creating the infrastructure and uh, uh, the public awareness about the use of water, which guarantees optimum results. Iraq has lost uh, uh, area over the Shat el Arab, which uh, was called the marshland of uh, Iraq, first due to the policies of Saddam Hussein, who wanted to eradicate resistance in the, in the marshlands and uh, dry the area. Then after Saddam has uh, been done away with, the region was rehabilitated somehow but now it is facing a catastrophic drought again. And this is uh, certainly due partly to the bad management of resources. I do not want to be unfair to those who are responsible for this in Iraq, but we have to acknowledge that a country in turmoil, as it is now in Iraq, has major difficulty in addressing a complex issue like the issue of water. Here also we have to speak very honestly about the role of Iran, because much as Turkey is struggling to provide the agreed share of water uh, to Iraq, uh, Iran has simply and curtly blocked entire rivers from flowing into Iraq. And uh, this, of course, has to do also with water management issues in Iran. Uh, I don't want to elaborate on that, but you all know that there have been significant mass protests inside Iran against uh, the uh, misuse of water or rather the um, very uh, pathetic uh, water policy implemented by the government. This about the water on matters of energy, essentially, I do agree with both of you that the fate of JCPOA may be a game changer. However, I also see that uh, the situation uh, around Ukraine has a, a tragic impact on what is ongoing and uh, the irresponsibility of Russia over um, seeing the world struggle for energy and uh, face a major economic downturn, uh, which would not only hit Western Europe, but it would hit the entire world. And it would have impacts, of course, on uh, all major economies. This uh, is all interrelated. In other words, it is imperative that there should be uh, uh, an end to Russia's aggression against the Ukraine, that there should be a ma major drive to revert Russia to reason if this is if, if this is possible. I have to say that 
the demise of Mr. Gorbachev yesterday was a very sad, tragic, historic milestone because we have seen how he was a paragon of opening up Russia to the world and how his labor of a life came to a, a tragic uh, uh, and undeserved end uh, under the current circumstances. And Russia is closing again on itself and causing enormous harm to itself and to the world because the world without Russia is, uh, is losing Russia. And this is a major loss. We should not forget Russia is not about economy only. Russia is about culture, a piece of civilization. And Russia has been a part of uh, everything that, ongoes, that is ongoing in international politics and a permanent member of the United uh, uh, of, of the Security Council of the United Nations. So I am hopeful that not only Turkey, which is a key conduit to Russia, but also finally the major Middle Eastern countries will be uh, forthcoming and will be using their influence on Russia to change its mind and to seek an end to its aggression against Ukraine. I, I have no other word for it. It's an aggression, clear-cut aggression. And we need to make sure that this comes to an end for the benefit of the entire world. Okay, thank you very much, Gergi and Asif. Um, it is five past six, so I uh, we will end up here. I would like to thank uh, our speakers for their time um, and interactive engagement uh, uh, and discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Asif and Gurgi, uh, for today. And thanks to everyone who joined us for this webinar. Uh, with that, uh, have a good evening. And yes, uh, a, a reminder, next week we will also continue with the discussion on the geopolitical uh, uh, competition uh, in the Middle East, and the focus will be in the U.S. And uh, for that, we have uh, our research senior research fellow, Jean Loeb, who will deliver the lecture. So please join us next week as well. And thank you very much. <laughs>